What's going on guys? Comics Kid 2099 here to examine an issue of Captain America. No, uh, just kidding. It's the other thing that I do. Today I am talking about uh, Uncanny X-Men issue 149 brought to you by uh, all of these fine folks right here. Uh, this issue opens with the X-Men uh, repairing the danger room. Remember uh, about 10-ish uh, issues ago, uh, Kitty Pride uh, was running away from an Ingerai demon uh, and uh, it destroyed a lot of the X-Men mansion and they are still uh, feeling the effects of that and I kind of like that. Uh, it seems to me back when the X-Men used to live in a mansion that uh, whenever it would get destroyed like two months later everything would just be back to normal and you wouldn't even know that the mansion had recently been destroyed. I remember uh, near the end of the uh, Morrison era uh, when they were uh, rebuilding the mansion after Magneto had done a lot of damage to New York. Magneto, not Magneto long story. Uh, and then like right after Morrison left, uh, you had uh, the X-Men Reloaded, which was a very soft relaunch of the X-Men books, and then the mansion is back to normal. Uh, and uh, I like that here, it's been a little while, but we're still reminding people that, hey, uh, something happened, and uh, we're not just uh, snapping our fingers and everything's back to normal. Uh, Kitty Pride has what is possibly the absolute worst costume uh, in all of superhero comics, uh, and Furthermore, people in the issue actually are commenting on how awful this uh, costume is. Storm thinks about how outrageous it is. Nightcrawler is about to say uh, how awful it is, and Storm says, hey, you know, don't, don't say anything. Uh, I don't know what in the world uh, was going through the mind of uh, Claremont and Cockrum and Joe Rubenstein if maybe they were thinking they were going to give Kitty a series of costumes. She's young, uh, and she hasn't fully settled on her identity yet, and so uh, she doesn't quite know what she wants to look like, and so she she has this hodgepodge of everything awful from the 1980s, and then maybe the next time that we see her, she'll be wearing a different costume. I, I have no idea. Um, I do like the idea of superheroes who have a costume, and then every now and then they shake things up, uh, but this is just the worst. And when characters in the issue are also saying that it's the worst, then you have to wonder, okay, why did the people making this comic make this costume like deliberately the worst. Uh, I think out of all of Kitty Pride's costumes, my favorite is actually the blue uh, kind of diaphanous, like part of it is see-through, part of it's not. Uh, I think she wore that mostly through Excalibur, uh, but that was probably my favorite uh, outlook or uh, outfit for her. Um, outfit and uh, the look for her. I was combining words there. Uh, that was probably my favorite for her, but this is just hard to look at. Uh, it's awful. And speaking of awful, uh, Kitty Pride uh, is in this issue. Uh, I have said before that I'm not a big fan of Kitty. I will say she is written like a real 13-year-old. Uh, when you're 13, a lot of times you think that the world revolves around you, and a lot of times you think uh, that uh, everything is just awful, or, or is just, you know, you are uh, it, and everything else is just, you know, doesn't matter. And in this issue, Kitty uh, destroys uh, some of uh, the danger room uh, control panel circuits. She walks through the wall, and we've established in earlier issues that uh, when Kitty walks through electronics, it destroys them. Uh, and I guess she just forgot, uh, and Professor X kind of yells at her, uh, and then she walks away kind of crying, uh, and I guess she's upset that he doesn't like her awful, awful costume. Uh, and then I guess she doesn't learn her lesson because then she phases through the floor slash ceiling down into the danger room, and I would think there are computer circuits there as well. Uh, so, like, seconds after Professor X said, hey, don't do that, your power is destroying our computers, then she does it again. Uh, and then, uh, meanwhile, Professor X is thinking about how uh, Magneto is probably up to something. Now, a few issues ago, uh, Professor X uh, felt that the magnetic atmosphere of the planet was being altered. Uh, this was, I believe, uh, when uh, Miss Locke, uh, Arcade's uh, sidekick, had kidnapped uh, the X-Men's loved ones, and Professor X kind of thought in one of those issues, hey, there's something going on with the magnetic uh, atmosphere. So he, in this issue, says, 
well, I have this gut feeling that Magneto is doing something. No, you have a pretty good reason to suspect Magneto is 100% doing something, uh, but you don't mention the magnetic atmosphere thing from a few issues ago. Uh, also, this issue is acting like Professor X has no idea who Magneto is. Uh, at one point, he says, uh, origins unknown. Uh, but less than 30 issues from now, we are going to get an issue that shows uh, that Professor X has known Magneto for years. Uh, and then uh, a page later, he says, uh, I have come to know this Magneto, and he and I were not that different. Uh, yeah, you have come to know him over a course of several years. You've known him for a very long time, since well before you met any of the X-Men. Uh, so this is clearly something that, uh, and by that point, uh, when we get to that issue, I don't think that Cockrum is on the book anymore. Uh, this is very clearly something that Claremont was just kind of making it up as he went along. That's fine. I actually like the idea that these two are lifelong friends uh, and that they went their separate ways before uh, Charles formed the X-Men. I like that retcon. I'm okay with that. Uh, but it is weird when you go back and read this issue that very clearly uh, Charles has no idea who Magneto is. And then they don't even try to sweep that under the rug or try to acknowledge that in any way when they do retcon it later on. Uh, and then uh, Charles sends the X-Men to the Savage Land, which was his last known base of operations, to see if there's any evidence that Magneto uh, is there. Uh, Kitty Pride sneaks along, again, because she's awful. Uh, she thinks, hey, it's no big deal. Uh, I should be able to go along. And this is the first time we are told Kitty is a uh, X-Man in training. She is not a full-fledged member of the team yet, uh, because... Uh, a little bit, a few issues ago, she had a cold, which was why uh, she did not go with uh, the team to Latveria. And I feel like if they didn't want uh, if they wanted uh, to kind of slowly phase Kitty into being uh, going on missions and stuff, they could have just said she's an X-Man in training when we had the arcade Doctor Doom storyline uh, for a few issues. But no, she was sick for a few issues. Or, or maybe I'm getting that confused with when the X-Men guest starred in Spider-Woman. I can't remember. But uh, anyway, now we're told she's not supposed to be going on missions. She's just an X-Man in training. And that is something... We will get more of that uh, when the New Mutant series starts. Uh, all up and down that uh, original New Mutant series, they are talking about how you guys live here, you do practice in the Danger Room, but you are not under any circumstances meant to go out uh, and fight people. Uh, and that makes it kind of difficult to tell stories in a superhero comic book. I'll get into that more as we get into the New Mutant stuff later on. But uh, Kitty basically acts like uh, she's the queen of the world. She should be able to do whatever she wants to do. Uh, and Storm yells at her a little bit. And then uh, we are going to get many more uh, instances of this. Uh, at least, uh, maybe it's not as prevalent as I thought it was. Uh, there might have only been like three different times where uh, Kitty Pride saves the day. Or what uh, a lot of people would call Wesley Crusher saves the Enterprise. And maybe there's only like three times this happens. I know there's at least one more, but it feels like a lot more, and it all happens within uh, such a short amount of time that it really feels like as soon as Kitty Pride was introduced that Chris Claremont instantly fell in love with this character, and then it was like, okay, she's the only one. She has to be the one that saves the day. Uh, I do kind of wish we could have had, like, Kitty sneaks along, and Storm says, hey, you're inexperienced. You could get someone hurt with your presence here. And for some idiot reason, she's got these roller skates, and she even tells Wolverine, oh, I can walk on the air, so I, I'm not using the roller skates. Okay, then why do you have the roller skates? Uh, I can think of, like, zero instances where having roller skates when you're out being a superhero would be useful or practical. Uh, if, you, if a bomb has gone off, if a building has been destroyed, there's rubble everywhere, you're not going to be able to use roller skates. So why the devil do you have roller skates? Uh, and throughout a good chunk of this issue, she's not able to use them. Uh, they're in a cave that has been flooded with lava. Uh, it's not going to be a flat surface. You're not going to be able to use those things. Uh, but uh, she uh, does end up, basically, they're exploring uh, what used to be Magneto's uh, base of operations here in the Savage Land. And we find out that uh, Garok, uh, Garok uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, uh, the bad guy from the Savage Land storyline uh, that was quite a while back, like around issue uh, 113, I think was what the footnote said, uh, the bad guy from that era, uh, era of X-Men stuff, uh, he is still alive. Uh, we thought that he had fallen uh, through a big, huge pit, and Storm tried to save him, but wasn't able to, and so now he's deformed even worse than he was, and uh, we are told Magneto saved Garak and told him, you stay here, make sure nobody comes to my old headquarters. That is 
possibly the biggest cop out that I've ever seen. Uh, we didn't know what had happened to Magneto when the X-Men ended up in uh, the Savage Land. Uh, and then later we saw him in Asteroid M and I think he was wounded. I think he had uh, like a leg brace on or something. Uh, so he was recovering from wounds uh, that happened when the X-Men were beating him to a pulp uh, in uh, the Savage, or in Antarctica. They weren't in the Savage Land. So now we are led to believe that Magneto, very weak from his encounter with the X-Men, was able to follow the X-Men to the Savage Land, decided not to reveal himself to them uh, after catching his second win, and then decided to save this guy he doesn't know, and then say, okay, I need you to stay here uh, closer to the Antarctic surface and make sure nobody comes in my headquarters. And meanwhile, we've seen Magneto at least three times uh, since he would have saved Garak. Uh, there was one issue where he was in Asteroid M, and we saw that he uh, had a picture of his wife Magda on the computer screen, and then there's uh, when he rescued Lee Forrester and Cyclops on the island, and then in this issue we see him again uh, on the island, and he doesn't seem to care about his Antarctic base. Uh, by now, it's been a long time. I would think if there's anything uh, important that you have uh, that Garak is guarding, just go get it. Uh, why do you have this guy here? Uh, I don't really get it. Basically, they just needed a reason for Garak to be alive uh, and just hanging out here, uh, and I think you could have just said, you know, Garak, he's like made of rock, so somehow he merged with the uh, the ground itself and then now he's like re-emerged in Magneto's headquarters and you could have just said you know he survived on his own uh, he's a weird god man thing uh, not to be confused with man thing but he is a thing that's kind of a god kind of a man uh, you don't have to say that Magneto rescued him that's just needlessly weird and confusing to me uh, but uh, Garak is upset at Storm because he looks even worse now uh, and then uh, the X-Men fight him a little bit and then Kitty Pride saves the day uh, she is the one who defeats Garak, and she, uh, with Colossus and Nightcrawler, she saves Storm, uh, and then, uh, we cut to, uh, the island that Cyclops and Lee Forrester are at, and Magneto says, hey, by the way, Cyclops, I know that it's you, and also your powers don't work here, so you can take off that blindfold. And that's the end of this issue, uh, and then we will get a big Magneto confrontation in the next one. Uh, also, this issue says, uh, that the X-Men have never defeated Magneto before, and, I would say that's not true. Uh, issue one of the X-Men, uh, while they didn't, like, arrest him or kill him, uh, they definitely stopped his plans of taking over Cape Canaveral. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, the issue where he was uh, in Antarctica and he had kidnapped him, uh, they beat him pretty good. Uh, he surprised them when they were... Uh, when. Uh, not Arcade Mesmero, when he had kidnapped them and had them in the circus, Magneto kind of took them by surprise and kidnapped them and brought them to Antarctica, but then they were able to get the drop on him really good. Uh, he ran away with his tail between his legs, and now this issue is saying uh, Magneto's never, ever, ever been defeated, and eh, it's just not quite true. Uh, now, you could say, like, he is one of our deadliest adversaries, and we've come really close to, uh, de you know, we've defeated him a couple times, but then the stranger, that weird alien uh, who wanted to bring Magneto to his alien zoo, uh, Magneto was defeated. Now, you could say the X-Men didn't defeat him, but this is making him seem like he is, like, the most unbeatable villain that you've ever seen, and eh, uh, the evidence uh, does not paint him that way. Uh, so that is about all that uh, I have to talk about uh, with this issue. I am glad that uh, Storm doesn't uh, talk about how she's claustrophobic. Uh, that is uh, something that makes the character feel more authentic and more real, but at the same time, Every single time the X-Men are in a tight spot, a literal tight spot, uh, and Storm is like, oh, my claustrophobia, oh, uh, goddess, am I ever going to be able to make it out of here? And it just kind of gets old, and you kind of wish that she would be able to get past it. That sounds insensitive, but when it's the same thing, and every time they're in a cave, and then there's a collapse, and then Storm starts panicking, it's the same thing. We've seen it a dozen times before. It gets old. It doesn't feel new or interesting. Uh, so I'm glad this issue didn't go to that well. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, not bad. Uh, I kind of like that they went back uh, looking for Magneto, and then they find something else there. Uh, and I had completely forgotten this issue, because uh, I knew uh, whenever I was examining 148, and I was like, okay, Magneto is going to be in 150. I couldn't remember what was in this issue. And this was fine. Uh, I uh, kind of like Garok, or Garok as an occasional bad guy. Uh, sometimes, like... Uh, Mojo and Arcade uh, show up, in my opinion, way too often. I really don't like those characters. And then you get someone like Garak, who doesn't show up very often at all. Uh, the X-Men have a lot of Savage Land adventures, but 
Garak is not in all those adventures, and he's kind of limited to the Savage Land, so he can only show up when they're in the Savage Land, and he doesn't show up in every Savage Land adventure, so this is a character I feel like they could bring back more often, and they don't. Uh, so, yeah, I like this issue okay. Uh, a little heavy on Kitty Pride. Uh, I don't like Kitty. I've said that before. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, I overall, I like this one. So let's consider this one examined.